Appreciate your attendance here this afternoon and talking about something that there's a high degree of confusion on this topic. The church has been inundated with teachings that support long-standing doctrines that have been fostered by groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists, as well as other denominational groups. And it's called the doctrine of annihilation or annihilationalism. And uh, it basically means that upon that one, if one is found unfaithful at judgment, that person is either immediately or eventually going to be annihilated. And the doctrine is one that uh, receives some support from a number of different areas. One is by a member of the Church of Christ, Lagarde Smith. Some of you might know Lagarde, who wrote a book that was called Afterlife. And he said, I wonder if you feel as uncomfortable as I do in our traditional view of hell. Do you really accept the traditional view of hell that says God sort of dangles you over the fires that burn day and night? Is that what hell is all about? Haven't you struggled with the idea of how there can be a loving God and anywhere in his presence permit that to exist? Doesn't it seem like cruel and unusual punishment? The author contends that Christ will banish the wicked to hell, but not with ongoing torment. Rather, and he uses the phrase, sooner or later, sooner or later, those cast into hell will cease to exist. Logically, the theory is flawed. It suggests that the punishment actually is non-punishment. If hell's destruction is annihilation and one enters destruction at death, then one is annihilated at death and there's no real actual punishment. You're just terminated, but there's no punishment and a non-entity, if you no longer cease to exist, can not be punished. And so that whole idea just simply doesn't make sense biblically. But yet they go on to suggest, as others like Bertrand, Bertrand Russell, famous British agnostic, he was expressing reason why he's not a Christian. And he said this, no person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. He recognized that Jesus believed in hell, that Jesus taught about hell, and at least he uh, acknowledges what some denominational preachers today uh, will not, and that is even the existence of hell. Getting back to something that Lagarde Smith said, God is not a twisted, cruel God who tortures the wicked, dangling them over licking flames. Both of these feel that there exists an irreconcilable moral dilemma. And that's really their first argument. And the argument that they go to the first is the idea of, don't you, how do you feel about that? Don't you think that it seems uh, unbelievable that our God would do something like this? So there's this moral dilemma between a loving God and an eternal hell. And due to that belief, Russell was the one that felt uh, that he needed to reject Christ altogether because he believed that Christ taught in uh, his teachings in the gospel accounts that there was going to be hell and that it was eternal. On the other hand, Smith, not wanting to reject Christ, not wanting to reject the gospel, uh, rejects the doctrine of eternal hell presented in the New Testament. And so both in some way or another have rejected a facet of the New Testament uh, teaching based on something that's completely subjective. And that is this uh, moral dilemma. It's no wonder that there is a problem here 
And because as Smith would say that you are, if you believe in eternal punishment, then a God that would do that is one that is twisted and cruel and evil. And so now those that would embrace such a, a doctrine have now been portrayed as seeing God in a most unfavorable light. Not to mention how it is one that has made God uh, be someone that is beyond the, the character presented in the pages of Scripture. But the Bible does teach that God will punish the wicked forever in hell. Now, talk about a moral dilemma. Let's flip that over for just a little bit and think about it from this perspective. Would you find comfort in knowing that if you are found unfaithful on Judgment Day, you're just going to get zapped out of existence? But you'd say, okay, if that's going to be what ends up happening, then I, I find comfort in knowing that. Well, let's run a little bit further down that trail. So if you find comfort in the idea that you're just going to be zapped out of existence, then does that also then motivate you to not be so concerned about living your life right? Because if at the end of it all, I'm just going to be zapped out of existence, then maybe you know, going ahead and eat, drinking, and be merry, and living my life the, the way I want to live it is uh, really not all that bad a choice. As a matter of fact, didn't Paul say something similar to that idea in 1 Corinthians 15? That if there's no resurrection, then we'd be better off just going ahead and eating, drinking, and being merry. You know, the Sadducees, who we read about in the Gospels, were those who did not believe in an afterlife. And as we read what historians have said about the doctrine of the Sadducees. They did face this uh, dilemma in that why should they live a life that was righteous if there was nothing really that was going to impact after one died? Well, all of the promises of God were in this life and that was the one reason that they could offer for faithfulness. But as far as whatever happened uh, when one died, they believed that you ceased to exist. What are some of the Bible passages, though, are the arguments that might be offered? We already mentioned that they contend that this is against the nature of God. And if you have your Old Testaments, I'd invite you to turn to this passage in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he says, beginning in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. One of the dangers that we always face is creating God in our image to developing a God that is going to act like us, think like us, react like us, do things the way we would do them. And Isaiah 55 is serving for us such an important warning about going there. In other words, don't go there. Don't go there and create a God in our own image, a God that is going to do things the way we think they should be done. Because God says, bottom line is, I don't. I don't do things like you. I don't think like you. I don't act like you. And so what are we left with? We're left with approaching the pages of Scripture with humility and accepting God as God describes himself. And what God is going to do, God is going to do, and it is ours to accept that and recognize that he is, in fact, God. You know, Paul would say, in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, behold both the kindness and the severity of God. There's two sides to God. 
And Paul says, you need to see both sides. You need to recognize that there is a severe side to God. Moreland said in that uh, quote that's on the, the slide right now, he accurately stated when questioned about the eternality of conscious punishment, many people, quote, tend to evaluate whether it's appropriate based on their feelings or emotional uh, offense to it. As quoted in Strobel's book, he went on to state the basis for their evaluation should be whether hell is a morally just or morally right state of affairs, not whether they like or dislike the concept. See, that's really the question. Uh, whether you like it or don't like it is beside the point. The point is God is the Lord of the moral universe and deciding what is moral and what is uh, immoral. He goes on, well, the, the extending that particular point, the alleged moral dilemma presented by Smith and Russell is one that is based on emotions and not on accurate assessments of morality or justice. Upon further investigation, there proves to be no dilemma at all because we acknowledge and recognize God's God and God has the right to decide what he is going to do. What are the arguments then that are being presented for this idea of annihilation? Let's break it down and look at the primary arguments. First of all, one is related to Sodom and Gomorrah. And as a term is being presented regarding the uh, reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, it uses a term that they say is one that pre it's a present participle indicating uh, continuous action. Uh, well, that, that's against the very thing that they're arguing against. Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened as we read the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, uh, fire came down and those cities were destroyed. And so is the Bible teaching that they were annihilated, that those uh, cities and the people that live there cease to exist? Well, the very words that the Bible uses indicates a continuing action, that the punishment is that which is ongoing. Oh, there also we'll talk about the word, uh, uh, the uh, the idea of destroyed, that people are destroyed. Well, the meaning of the, the word destroyed in, that we have in the Bible, for example, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, is not a word that means or has ever meant the idea of annihilation. So it's uh, the very terms that are being used in order to defend the view is something that is uh, not working. What about the soul? The soul uh, and the second death that is described in various passages. Well, uh, the soul is something that is eternal. And it's eternal despite where the, the soul ends up on the other side of uh, death. God created us where the, the body would die, the soul would live on. And so as Jesus is cautioning the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, not to fear those who can kill the body, but fear him who can destroy, there's that word that doesn't mean annihilate, but he can punish the, both the body and the soul in hell. The soul lives on the soul is the most precious thing that we have, the most precious possession that God has given us. And that's why we have to recognize, as Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 16, that there's nothing that you have. Even if you gain the whole world, it's not worth forfeiting your soul, even if you owned it all. Because that's the most important thing that we have, the most precious possession. 
Now that being true then, we need to protect our soul and we need to recognize that our soul is going to spend somewhere in eternity. And that's the point that is humbling and should be motivating to all of us. All right, let's do a little bit deeper dive then on some of these arguments. All right, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and you got the, the basic argument that Sodom and Gomorrah, according to this theory of annihilationism, was basically wiped from the face of the earth and the people were annihilated. Well, using language from the inspired writer in Jude, is that particular word as a present participle indicating that continuous action is what is being referred to. And then the, the analogy or the description of chaff are examples of uselessness. You say, well, the chaff is that which is consumed in the flame. Well, that's not meant to present a illustration of annihilation, but uselessness, and that's the way those that are unfaithful are being viewed by God. And it also doesn't fit with the idea of unquenchable fire. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with uh, doing a lot of camping and making fires. What happens when you no longer have any wood, if you no longer have any fuel? Well, the fire goes out, right? But the Bible describes in passages like Matthew 3 that the fire is unquenchable. If there's no more fuel, then why does the fire need to burn on? Well, it doesn't need to burn on. It doesn't make any sense at all. But the fact that it's unquenchable fire is that which lines itself with the idea that the punishment is also going to be ongoing because it continues to have those who are in the fires of hell. What about argument number three that we briefly looked at just a minute ago, that people are, quote, destroyed in hell? Now, if you haven't, uh, uh, if you have already turned there, turn to Matthew chapter 10, and let's read that again together. Matthew 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. In looking at this, uh, uh, this particular text, the Greek word that Jesus uses is apolumi, and it doesn't require the meaning of extinction. When we look at other places like we have listed there, Matthew 15, 24, Luke 15, verse 32, uh, shows that the word or the concept of extinction just isn't there. Nowhere, as a matter of fact, does the word mean extinction. You look at various men like there who said to devote or give over to eternal misery. All right, interesting but an accurate definition of that word. And then we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3 along with some other passages that uses another Greek word that is translated destruction. The word is defined in the New Testament away from the presence of the Lord. Uh, the life of pleasure is destroyed and replaced by a life of eternal punishment. And we compare that and I invite you to turn over to Luke chapter 12 verses 4 and 5. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of these who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you to whom to fear. Fear the one whom after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Would there be a need to fear if that cast into hell was nothing more than a momentary zap and a puff and you are, are gone. And that's basically the end of it. But to be cast into a place is language that indicates some finality and uh, that which includes duration of time. There's something to fear 
because of the power that God possesses in doing this. We also look at argument number four, that God is a consuming fire. So those who are annihilationists will say, there you have it, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, God consumes. Well, again, when we think of the language, it describes the all-inclusiveness of God's judgment. Who is not going to be brought into God's judgment? No one will escape. All are going to be caught up in his judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged according to the deeds that we've done in the body, whether good or evil. There's no escaping. Other passages that say the fire is not quenched, we talk about that, so we'll not repeat that particular point, but Jude 7 and Matthew 25, which is a passage that we'll come back to later. There are some further considerations that uh, also need to be made. But when we think about what we have looked at so far, Paul does not hesitate to affirm that those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel will suffer eternal punishment, even the eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. So the term destruction doesn't connote or mean annihilation. Rather, it is one that is future misery. And when we think about this Consider some other ideas that all uh, contribute to our understanding of this topic. Most often, when the word that is used destroyed, and by the way, this is the apolumi word that is found in Matthew 10, is used to mean annihilation. Most often, it simply signifies the idea of suffering the loss of well-being, the loss of being blessed, like in Luke 15. Jesus spoke of the shepherd's lone sheep that was lost. Well, guess what word that is? That's uh, our word. He wasn't annihilated. The sheep was just lost. In that same chapter, Jesus talks about the prodigal son. And he says the son was lost. That's that same word, that apolumi word. He was not extinguished. He was not annihilated, uh, but was just that which was lost. The wineskins of which Jesus spoke of in Matthew 9 and verse 17 did not pass into non-existence, but they were ruined. Uh, that's our word. Jesus said that he came to seek and save those who were lost. He didn't can't come to save those who were uh, annihilated or no longer existed, but they were spiritually away from home and they were ruining their life being away from God. And Jesus came to bring them back. In Luke 19 and verse 10, uh, Paul stated that the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. Well, that's our same word. And he stated that the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing in sin, not to people that are uh, exterminated, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3. Even when the word apolumi is used to mean death, like in Matthew 2 verse 3 and Matthew 8 verse 25, total annihilation of the person isn't even being thought of in those particular passages. There's not a single instance in the New Testament where the word destroyed means annihilation. The scriptures clearly teach that those who at judgment will be destroyed because of their wickedness will be destroyed in the sense that they have ruined their lives and are now going to a place that is going to uh, be uh, deserving of the choices that they have made and they will join the devil and the false prophet who will be tormented day and night forever and ever, according to the scriptures. All right, with those considerations in mind, let's think about some other ideas. First of which is this idea of 
the soul. Though an enemy might terminate one's bodily existence, he cannot, as Jesus affirmed, destroy the soul. This could not have been said if human beings were entirely mortal. If the word doesn't mean exterminate, then what exactly does it mean when we think about this idea of destroy? The imagery would hardly be appropriate, appropriate if the human spirit itself were that which was going to be an, an, totally annihilated. When we think about the souls under the altar in Revelation chapter 6, John saw souls in a, in a sense because they were the souls of them that were slain. These souls were under the altar of God. Their dead bodies were still on the earth, but their souls were those that continued to exist. The resurrection had not happened yet, but yet these souls were those that were crying out for God's justice, hoping that God would then bring about the punishment upon evil men that um, at that point had not taken place. They were assured, though, that the appropriate punishment was, in fact, going to take place. So they were souls that had lived on. What about the meaning of this word eternal? I think if we were all interviewed and asked our view about this, we probably would all love to believe that hell is only a temporary punishment or even better that we just get zapped and we cease to exist. There's a level of comfort in a doctrine like that. But I cannot find any verses to indicate that as being true. I don't like the idea of a person being punished for eternity, especially the sweet old grandmother, as much as I dislike the concept of anybody that I know and love facing that kind of punishment. But this is where you and I come to the, the point of decision. Are we going to abide by what the scriptures teach or not? Are we going to accept God and God's supreme perfect knowledge and then move forward with what God has said that he is going to do? The question is, therefore, what does the Bible say about punishment for the fallen human race? And the word eternal is central to the discussion of, about annihilationism. Edward Fudge, in his book, said this, The wicked, following whatever degree of duration of pain that God may justly inflict, will finally and truly die, perish, and become extinct forever and ever. In his writing, The Fire That Burns. All right, so he, along with Lagarde Smith, were those that were kind of champions of this particular uh, viewpoint. As a matter of fact, getting back to uh, something that uh, Smith had said. You can read that. If you have a computer Bible program or an antiquated concordance, pull up the word eternal and be prepared for a shock. In all of its many associations, there is not a single hint of time. To be eternal is to have a lasting nature, to have the kind of qualities which endure despite the passing of time, if, in fact, there is any time at all. He goes on to say, To say, then, that we will have eternal life in heaven says nothing about how long we will live in heaven. It's already begun before we get there. The point is that life in heaven will be quantitatively different kind of life from the one we have known in earth, space, and time. All right, it sounds pretty good. And he does, in fact, challenge us to uh, go ahead and do some work. 
which we will certainly do. He goes on to say, eternal life bespeaks the nature of hell's fire, not its duration. When we hear Jesus speaking about eternal fire, there's no reason to think in terms of clocks or calendars. Time is not the issue. Eternal punishment will no more be punishment throughout an endless eternity than was the immediate devastating punishment suffered by the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've already talked about that <clears throat> particular viewpoint. So what is the meaning of the word eternal? We want to talk about, and uh, I recognize that this might be a little bit more technical than we would normally be used to, but we're studying something seriously here, and we have to recognize that if we don't understand the terms that are being used in the Bible, then we're not going to understand the doctrine associated with those terms. And so it's important that we study these words. Uh, Art Gindrich and Danker is uh, perhaps the most noted uh, Greek theological lexicon in the world today. Uh, we just refer to it as BDAG. It was originally authored by uh, Walter Bauer. And anybody that studies Greek words is very familiar with the credibility of this particular source. Says this of the word eternal. It is a long period of time without reference to beginning or end. Notice right off the bat, they're bringing in the idea of time. He said, a segment of time as a particular unit of history, an age. And then three definitions are then provided for Ionios, pertinent to a long period of time, a long ago, are pertinent to a period of time without beginning or end, eternal of God. And then third, pertinent to a period of unending duration without end. So, when we do what Smith challenged us to do and go and, and find a lexicon, well, right off the bat, what are the lexicons doing? They're saying that these Bible words are connecting us uh, with the idea of time. According to A.T. Robertson, the word ionios means either without beginning or without end or both. It comes as near to the idea of eternal as the Greek can put it in one word. All right, so there's that idea of time from him as well. Joachim Gert, in the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, another uh, very noted uh, theological uh, Greek uh, uh, definition book, stated that, uh, Ion is primarily a designation for a long period of time. Eternity is thus not necessarily a timeless concept, but the most comprehensive temporal one which the experience of time has produced. And then the Theological Dictionary in the New Testament says, in the sense of prolonged time or eternity. Later, when discussing Ionios as a term for the object uh, eschatological expectation, Saucy indicated that it was likewise used to mean uh, unceasing or endless, while sometimes extending beyond the purely temporal, temporal meaning. Well, that Greek thing got all messed up, didn't it? When we consider other usages of this word, in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18, he indicated the antithesis of the spiritual things that are eternal, are the physical, things which are temporary. All right, all we're doing is saying, all right, if we lose, if we flip that coin over, what are some of the antonyms to the idea? Well, temporal versus Eternal, both are time words. And Paul, in his letter to Philemon, wrote that perhaps his servant Onesimus departed for a while so that he, Philemon, might receive him 
forever. All right, a while versus forever. The word ionios is used uh, 70 times throughout the New Testament. Three times it is used to describe God's eternal nature. Now note that. If you want to argue that the word does not mean unending time, then you're also disparaging one of the attributes of God himself. Because it's the same word used to describe the unending nature of God. It's found over 40 times in the New Testament in reference to the unending happiness of the righteous and five times it's used in reference to the punishment of the wicked. Now, think about this. If if it refers to the unending happiness of the righteous, you're going to be happy forever and ever and ever. But it doesn't really mean forever and ever. Then... There could be a time when your days in heaven are over. Your eternal life is gone. If, in fact, there could be some sense of an end to time with this word. But that is our point. There isn't uh, such a thing. There are so many verses that we uh, can look at. And we're we're just going to, to quickly go through these. Um, but it illustrates the point. Eternal fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, are those fires going to burn eternally? And is the devil going to be zapped and no longer uh, exist? Well, there are some verses that are going to contribute to that idea that we'll see in just a minute. Uh, Jude 6, talking about the angels will be bound with everlasting chains. Revelation 20 and verse 10, the devil, beast, and the false prophet are being tormented. Notice this, forever and ever. Does that give you any sense at all that there is a termination point? That the devil might be punished for a short time and then he himself will be annihilated? Well, forever and ever is trying to indicate exactly as we've always understood it. And that is unending. But that's the same language that is being described on what's going to happen to the unfaithful. In Matthew 18, verse 8, they're thrown into eternal fire. We already defined the word eternal and noted that it doesn't, it can't mean something that has an end. Matthew chapter 9, verse 43, the fire never goes out. All right, we talked already about that too, the idea of you got to have fuel for fire to continue to burn. It's like on the wood fire, if you don't continue to give it wood, it's going to go out. Well, the fire is an eternal fire. It never goes out, according to Mark 9. And then later on in Mark 9, it talks about the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. Again, the fire is not quenched. Isaiah 33, verse 14, talks about everlasting burning. Luke 3 and verse 17, with unquenchable fire. And that same term is used by Jesus in Matthew 3 and verse 12. All right, more of the same. There's plenty to to go around here when we think about these particular terms. Matthew 25 and verse 46, they will go away to eternal punishment. Is the punishment going to be ongoing? Or if the punishment is that you're being zapped, then it's not eternal punishment. Um, You were punished initially, and then there's no more punishment. Well, think about that for a minute. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Luke or Jude 7, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fires. So we saw what happened in the Genesis account, and that punishment continues. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, some uh, to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. So if the contempt is that which is, uh, has an end, then the life can have an end too. 
And then we talked about 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9. Uh, then they will be punished with everlasting destruction. Paul has something to weigh in on this in Galatians. He says, if someone preaches another gospel, he is to be anathema, the idea of eternally condemned. Isaiah 66, verse 24, those that rebelled against God, their worm will not die, nor will the fire be quenched. How about Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Mark chapter 3, verse 29, those who blaspheme will be guilty of an eternal sin. In Isaiah 34, 8 and following, the Lord has a day of vengeance that will not be quenched night or day, its smoke will rise forever. All right, threw a lot at you there, a lot of verses that we uh, could have spent time talking about, but logic is one, which is why the view has been uh, consistent through the decades that the word eternal is describing both the life and the punishment and that it is ongoing the idea of termination you might say what do they do with Lazarus in Luke 16 ever wondered that the discussion that Lazarus is having according to this view the discussion that Lazarus is having with Abraham is one while his body is slowly being consumed in the flame. Now, does that sound to you the, the way that, uh, uh, that is going in that particular text? No, he is looking for some comfort. He's looking for a way out. He's looking for anything. Um, but his torment is something that is certainly that which he is enduring. And there is no hint no evidence that it's going to come to an end. Abraham doesn't say, well, Lazarus, uh, hold on a little bit longer. You're just going to be zapped out of existence in a little while anyway. Uh, the worm is not going to die, is what uh, the Bible teaches. In Matthew 25, verse 46, the word that we're talking about, uh, eternal, appears twice. Once in reference to eternal punishment, and once in reference to eternal life. Okay, same word, eternal punishment, eternal life. Simply put, if the punishment mentioned in this verse is temporary, then so is heaven. That's the only way that that verse can be explained. Contextually, the two are linked. Just as Jesus expected his disciples to understand heaven as a place of permanent, unending happiness for conscious souls of people, he likewise intended for them to understand hell as a place of permanent, unending torment for conscious souls. The fact that Christ made a special point of repeating Ionios in the same sentence requires that we stay with the plain meaning of the word. Both heaven and hell will be eternal or unending in duration. Some others of our uh, fellowship who have commented on this, Eric Lyons of Apologetics Press, said this, Matthew 25, 46 serves as a death knell to the theory of annihilationism. Those who teach the limited duration of hell either refrain altogether from commenting on this particular verse or the comments they make, like Smith's, are disorderly and void of evidentiary support. In Homer Haley's work on God's judgment, in which half of the book was dedicated specifically to defending the position that hell is not eternal, he never once gave a clear explanation of this verse. Moreover, whenever uh, Ion is brought into the discussion, the case against annihilationism is strengthened considerably. If God lives forever and ever, Revelation 1.8, and glory is given to him forever and ever, Revelation 1.6, and if the saved shall reign forever and ever with the Lord in heaven, Revelation 22.5, then the wicked assuredly will be tormented day and night forever and ever, Revelation 20.10. Forever and ever is the formula of eternity, Vincent says. Without a doubt, it denotes duration even when describing punishment of hell 
Moses Stewart said, If the scriptures have not asserted the endless punishment of the wicked, neither have they asserted the endless happiness of the righteous, nor the endless glory and existence of the Godhead. The one is equally certain with the other. Notice that. The one is, they're bound, they're bound together. Both are laid in the same balance. They must be tried by the same test. And if we give up one, we must, in order to be consistent, give up the other one. Some other considerations as we wrap this up. In Matthew eleven twenty two and 24, and in Luke 12 and verse 47, Jesus indicated that there's going to be degrees of punishment in hell. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 and 20 verses 20 and 21, Peter says it's better off uh, better not to have known the way of righteousness. Why is it better off? If the punishment is annihilation, how can there be degrees of annihilation? That particular idea doesn't seem to make much sense. And what about uh, some of these other points, like the worm does, dies not and the fire is not quenched? Annihilationists want there to be death, want there to be termination. But Jesus said the fire is not quenched and the worm doesn't die. This is the verse that describes hell. Worm is a metaphor for never dying tormentor of the wicked. And then in Revelation 14, it might be easier if you just turn in your Bible. I've just got the text there, but let's read that together. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, we talk about passages that are ungetaroundable. That's one of them. That's one that is undeniable that, th that those who are unfaithful are going to suffer eternal punishment. Also, Revelation 22 and verse 15 describes the, the holy city, the new Jerusalem where the righteous live, and then says, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Now, I recognize that there is symbolism in ap apocalyptic literature, yet the verse must mean something. And there's no way, even with apocalyptic language, that someone that is zapped from existence is annihilated is, and then you're going to turn right around and say that they're outside of the holy city. They are those that continue to exist. And so uh, that's uh, a passage that simply will not fit with the doctrine of annihilationism. Jeremiah 6 says, and the false prophets and priests have healed the wound of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. This is a doctrine that offers people a degree of peace. And God's word doesn't offer that peace. Therefore, those who are not troubled by the thought of being annihilated, but are terminated at the thought of eternal punishment in hell, receive that level of, well, I don't guess that sounds really all that bad. Brothers and sisters, we recognize that God's plan is one that is clear. And that when judgment day comes, 
the only logical thing for us is to make sure that we're ready, that we're prepared, that we have recognized the warnings, because we'll know if, in fact, we end up in eternal punishment. We'll know that we knew better. We'll know that the scriptures taught that this was the end for those who were not faithful. God is one that is loving and kind and has sent his son to die for us, has provided us opportunity to make it right, make our relationship with him one that is going to assure us eternity in heaven. And so there's no reason. There's no reason for us not to seize what God has done for us and be ready to live with him forever and ever. Thank you so much for your attention.